Yeah, thanks for having me, Robin. Thanks, Preston. It's nice to see you, Rachel. It's nice to be back. So, uh, quite a week, right? Um, can we start by, yeah, let's start, I like, let's start on a positive note before we launch in. Can we talk about the Senate victories in Georgia and their lessons for the country? It seems like Tuesday's Warnock and Ossoff victories have sort of been lost in the chaos of the week. Yeah, I feel sort of bad for them because they absolutely crushed those victories and obviously they were needed and, and hard fought. So I think we need to think a lot about organizing and organizing the South and remember that, you know, a, a new democracy is possible and a better democracy is possible and it's gonna start in the South and we already have a model for it and we know that it can win. So I think that both the, I mean, Ossoff really rode Warnock's coattails. And so anybody who thinks that he didn't is a fool, I think, because it was the black vote and the black turnout um, in the Atlanta suburbs that really sealed the deal for Warnock and Ossoff benefited from that. But I also think that that win is replicable uh, in other Southern states. So, you know, as we have a conversation about what the future looks like, and about voting in particular and strengthening voting and voter protections, I think Georgia is obviously a place where we need to start thinking. And I also think there's a place for um, Stacey Abram to continue to build models for democratic participation and those that are particularly focused on issues that affect black voters and other voters of color. And I think the democratic party has to take that seriously if it wants to continue to win, especially in uh, this white supremacist moment. I heard her, I, obviously I've been doom scrolling like crazy this week yeah. and, and I've seen several memes that I think are very useful but one of the great things I saw this week was the south is not, um, it's not conservative, it's suppressed and I think that we get to see like a pretty good example in Georgia of if we can actually get people to vote we do have quite, quite a better chance of changing the trajectory down here. I mean, it's suppressed, but it's also gerrymandered. So insofar as we're talking about suppression as intimidation and, um, you know, voter ID laws, but it's also redistricting. And that's a big issue here in Arkansas that obviously needs to be a ballot initiative. But I do think that one of the things that's going to come out of the first 100 days of the Biden administration when it begins is the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. And I think that that will help create um, new structures to expand what Abrams has done in Georgia. And that is good for the democracy, both because it registers new voters and expands voting participation. And, you know, it's going to it's going to include provisions that I think will make it easier to organize against open fascism. Um, but it's co it's coming. So I think that I think there's no doubt that the voting rights, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act is going to be top order of business. So I, uh, that's that's some, a nice positive note to start on. Um, there is maybe some light at the end of a very long, dark tunnel. Um, well, I mean, I do think that the Biden administration is going to happen. So, I mean, I, 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 that's a good place to start. Yeah, I think the next 10 days are going to be totally wild. But I do think that the Biden administration is a foregone conclusion. I'm glad that we got that out right in the beginning. I think <laughs> that's good. Let's jump. Let's jump the lowest hurdle possible before going. <laughs> totally. totally. Um, you laugh so you don't cry, right? Um, obviously, the president, some members of Congress, the Proud Boys, and other alt right groups have been calling for the rally to stop the steal uh, for weeks. But people seem surprised at Wednesday's result um, from the rally turned mob. Why are we so surprised? Uh, we don't listen as a people. <laughs> I think white people in particular don't listen. They don't listen to arguments about, you know, anti-blackness. They don't listen to arguments about, um, about fascism. I think they, you know, I'm glad that you talked about doom scrolling, but they don't joy scroll and they don't produce new forms of, of power. And so I think that they just thought the same thing that they thought when Trump was running for office. Oh, you know, he'll moderate once he's in office. It's not going to be that bad. He's really just a finance capital kind of guy. You know, yeah, he's going to benefit from all this fascism and these neo-Nazis, but he's not the same guy as them. And I think that they told themselves those things, even though it was happening right in front of their faces, because they didn't want to believe it's true. And so that like sort of, you know, head in the sand ostriching is really bad. <laughs> and now we're at the point where everybody's like, I didn't know. How did this happen? And it's like, 
they organized online. News was covering it pr pretty faithfully that it was happening. I think they were just surprised at the form that it took. And I don't really know why, because they, these are the same people who understand that like gun violence is a problem. And like, you know, mass shootings are a, a, a form of American public participation and AR-15s are normalized. And, you know, they also see all this discourse about guns and insurgency that's like pretty mundane in America now. So I think that they're their disbelief about it is in some ways disingenuous because it's not like everybody hasn't been talking about this for months. And I will say part of it is also media, right? So media silos exist. So if you're reading the media that's talking about these things all the time, then you know it's happening. But I mean, at least in Arkansas, there's no rural broadband. So we have huge swaths of Arkansas and also the South and also the Midwest and also most of America that doesn't have access to your MSNBC news feed, right? They're not listening to NPR. So I do think that the media silos also, in some ways, account for folks not knowing, you know, how this was all going to go down. And I would say even in Arkansas, rural Arkansans who are pro-Trump are stunned, quite frankly, that the, the storming of the Capitol happened the way that it did. So I do think that there's a huge disconnect um, in terms of both media access and media literacy that accounts for that, but also some of it I think is just disingenuous white liberals clutching their pearls about how they can't imagine that white people are so terrible. It just occurred to me that, you know, I think a lot of our audience, AAFF's audience, maybe not all of, but I think a non-zero portion has potentially been, uh, has potentially removed themselves from the news scroll because it is a lot to take in. And I wonder if it wouldn't be a bad idea to just do a very brief rundown on like what exactly it is that occurred before we launch into all of the hows and whys and whatnots. Yeah, I, that, so that's unfolding. So, you know, we've been four days out from four, what is this Sunday? Four and a half days out from um, a mob insurrection at the US Capitol where there has not been a defense briefing from any defense agency in the United States full stop. So um, yeah, even if you were scrolling the news, you wouldn't have any government agencies with the exception of members of Congress who had individual accounts or the, or the, or the Senate and House minority leaders who are offering any assessment of what happened. So, you know, the Department of Defense, nothing, you know, uh, the Department of Justice, nothing, the Capitol Police, nothing. I mean, there have been absolutely no press briefings from any of the security organizations responsible for Capitol security. So that in and of itself is probably the most stunning you know, piece of information that people need to understand. Beyond that, what we do know is that a group of Trump supporters were encouraged by the president and members of Congress um, who supported him to uh, have a rally that eventually made its way over to the US Capitol. And then members of that insurrectionist mob uh, barreled their way into the Capitol with zip ties and Molotov cocktails and handmade bombs and open carried weapons to try and potentially kidnap and harm uh, uh, members of Congress. So those are the facts such as they are. I mean, the rest of the story is still coming out in bits and pieces. Fortunately, uh, you know, the Capitol is full of surveillance. So the archives of the US Capitol are preserving, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of hours of tape of, you know, insurgents who are anti-maskers and not, were not wearing COVID masks, who are, who, their entire faces are everywhere. And those same insurrectionists uploaded their own videos of them committing various crimes of treason and sedition inside of the US Capitol. So there's no, there's no lack of, of evidence about the crimes that were committed on Wednesday. They were, they were, they, you know, they were, they were transmitting their own videos <laughs> and Facebook living their own crimes. So there's just a huge deluge of information and a visual surveillance of what these um, seditionists, insurrectionists were doing. So what do you make of the Capitol Police's role in Wednesday's insurrection? And what do you think will happen to Capitol security? So that's, I, you know, I think that this is the double-edged sword. So, you know, every generation I think has these defining securitization moments. You know, in, in the Mid-South, it was the Oklahoma City bombing, right, in, in 93. And it was, you know, 9-11 for many millennials. And so we have these moments that, um, that I think, I don't know, 
they, they attract our attention and they define an entire generational cohorts understanding of security. Um, and so this is one of those. And I think, you know, obviously the head of the Capitol police, police turned in his resignation to Nancy Pelosi on Friday, which is no surprise. Uh, it's clear that the, the, so the Capitol police are run by the Department of Justice. So they are actually, the D District of Columbia does not have jurisdiction over the Capitol police because they're not a state. So it is very conceivable, and I think we will find that it's very likely that the Department of Justice refused to authorize any National Guard support for the Capitol Police, even though that they, they knew that this, this um, insurrection was being planned in the open uh, because they supported it. So I think you've got folks in the Capitol Police leadership, as well as in the Department of Justice, who we will find aided and abetted the insurrection. I do think, though, that the Capitol Police who were on the ground were way outnumbered and totally outgunned. And it took 90 minutes for anybody to even respond to the mayor of DC's request for National Guard support. And both of the governors of Virginia and Maryland were told that they could not, even though they had mobilized their own National Guard, they couldn't send them into the District of Columbia without, without um, the Department of Justice and the Department of Defense uh, okaying it. So I think that they were left out to, to dry, quite frankly, um, and, they, and they were not given backup or support. So even though there are you know, police members in the, in the Capitol Police Force that certainly supported and aided and abetted the insurrection, I don't think that accounts for all of them. Now that's neither here nor there because obviously we have massive problems with policing to begin with. I do think that the result will be a hyper securitization of the US Capitol in the same way that we saw hyper securitization of airlines after 9-11, and after the shoe bomber, so we have to take our shoes off while we're still doing security theater um, in the airports. So not that any of us have been in any for a long time, but you know, I think that there will be a bunch of new security measures. And I mean, you know, the the, the Congress just passed right before the insurrection a seven hundred billion dollar military budget. So I can imagine a world in which a bunch of that money goes to hyper securitization in the Capitol and elsewhere. Certainly, I think, um, you know, depending on what the prosecution of these traders looks like, I can imagine a bunch of that military money getting funneled uh, into state governments as well. Do you see the sort of kidnapping attempt of Michigan's governor as like a prelude to this? Yeah. And, and if yes, yes, do you see that hyper securitization spilling over into state capitals as well? No, because they are poor. They're cash poor because, especially in the Republican states, they've given all the way their general operating budget money and tax cuts. So, you know, I think the longer term issue for understanding Trumpism as a movement of radicalized domestic terrorists is that the state capitals will continue to be marked. And that's a problem in Arkansas because our legislative session uh, in the General Assembly starts tomorrow. So I, you know, I think you have the same breakdown of sympathies towards Trumpism in uh, all of the police forces. Uh, the police have historically been the largest recruiting ground for you know, early iterations of the KKK and uh, white citizens councils, and certainly now for um, alt-right groups. So it shouldn't surprise anybody that there are Trumpists in, you know, the military industrial complex and, you know, the police uh, complex. And I will say, though, I do think that there is a serious conversation. I, I talked to a bunch of my sources in D.C. today and yesterday and the day before. We've been on the phone constantly. And they are saying that there are huge conversations happening because one of the provisions that came through in this military budget was the renaming of US bases um, so that they would not carry names of Confederate generals. And so there is a big conversation happening about renorming you know military organizations to deal with um you know complicity with seditious and anti-american you know insurrectionist movements so i do think that that conversation is starting i think it will probably be pushed along by the biden administration there was a big op-ed in um i want to say in foreign affairs yesterday that was pushing for a democracy democracy summit and it is making arguments about what it means, what it's gonna to mean to create accountability inside the military and inside the police forces, which is not really a conversation that's happened in those spaces before. Obviously I'm pessimistic about it, but it's not even a conversation, it's never been on the agenda. It's like, how do we deal with, you know, the way that our own, you know, security forces are producing domestic terrorists. That That is a conversation that's never been had publicly and there's been no accountability. So I do think that you know, as we as we crest this moment, there will be an increased scrutiny uh, in the Biden administration thinking about, you know, procedural norms and whatnot. I also think that, you know, thinking about the Capitol Police, they're not foiable. So 
Hmm. Like one thing that'll come out of the department, of, there's going to be a bunch that comes out of the department of justice. I imagine we'll talk about it, but you know, I think that there's going to be a really close um, scrutiny to all governmental oversight in DC and out elsewhere to make sure that the records of those organizations are available to the public on request. Um, the, as you mentioned earlier, the, this was all sort of live streamed, right? And people were documenting themselves uh, in the middle Prime. of this, in, right? Um, and so uh, in that several active police officers from across the country have been identified and are now being dealt with in their sort of local precincts. Can you talk a little bit about that? <laughs> like, when, like, how do we absorb that? And then for the folks that like maybe weren't there but were rooting for it on social media, like how do we proceed there? Well, I will say the bigger problem is that like the Chicago police union chief came out and supported it and said no violence happened and he supported any of his members who were there um, yesterday. And so, you know, I think the problem of police unions is a major problem. Police unions aren't, aren't actually unions. They just shield cops from accountability. So I think we need to have huge conversations about, you know, both de-escalating the use of force and violence and also how the radicalization of white supremacist nationalists is accelerated in, in and through police unions. So I think that you, you know, one of the interesting things about Kamala Harris being vice president is I think she will have a very uh, close role in reshaping the Department of Justice and the FBI and other intelligence organizations that work with um, local police and municipal police in particular. And I think that there is an opportunity there, although, you know, it's unclear how well they will seize it to um, deprivilege police unions um, and to really, as in the same way that the foreign you know, policy people wanna do, have a much larger conversation about the role of over-policing in the production of US empire and in the creation of domestic you know, terrorism here. So you know, I think that, I think, <laughs> I've been thinking a lot today with a bunch of my lawyer friends about jury nullification. So you know, on the one hand, I think folks are you know, rightly uh, glad to see the FBI so swiftly arresting uh, the terrorists at the Capitol on Wednesday. But on the other hand, they're going to go to trial, right? Assuming, assuming that they're not pardoned in time. And so they're going to have trial by jury. So what happens when the jury selection includes a bunch of other cops or <laughs> Trumpers or, you know, other domestic insurgents who will nullify right, the evidence and acquit. And so I think that, that there are really large looming questions about how we understand the depth and breadth of Trumpism as a source of domestic terrorism. I do think it's important to call it Trumpism and to, because, because he is the face of what fascism, open fascism in the United States looks like in this uh, era. And I don't think he should he should get a pass from it. I think his name should be attached to it. But I mean, it goes so deep and is also just such a permanent feature of the United States. So, you know, this moment that we're in, this fascist moment that we're in, you know, if, if we're just looking at the modern iteration of it, it is, you know, Goldwater, LBJ and Reagan in 66 producing law and order, language and politics. It's certainly Clinton and Bush, right, um, both uh, highlighting and, and funding U.S. militarization uh, abroad and, you know, in Somalia and, you know, certainly in Afghanistan and Iraq, and it's Trump. And in the long term, it's like slave catchers, and it's, you know, it's the Mississippi Sovereignty Commission, and it's the FBI surveillance of civil rights activists. So this thing that we're watching play out um, in the police forces is, is fundamentally American. And if you look at the founding fathers, man, they all they were was concerned with mob violence. They knew that this was the danger to the Republic. I think in some ways people think America is really enduring and it's old, which is so weird to me because I mean, even being generous, what are we 60 years old as an actual democracy? And even that's debatable because mm -hmm. we don't let so many people vote. So, you know, I, I just think there's so much in flux and there's so much work that needs to be done that thinking just about the individual cops is the smallest part in some ways, but it's also yeah. the most essential. Um, so language matters. Uh, you've earlier this week, uh, you mentioned that you don't think coup is the term that we should be using, um, but we're also finding out more and it's kind of, 
you know, things are changing as we go. But what is clear is that a well-prepared militia group was inside that group of Trumpists. Um, do you, you know, it's assumed that there were bigger plans. How's this not a coup attempt? Or can clarify this for us? Yeah, I mean, I think the political scientists, if they're being honest, they would call this an auto coup, right? Because the point is not to install somebody else, it's to keep the regime in who's already there. So I, technically, from a political science perspective, it's an auto coup, but I just really don't think that that's useful. It, that's useful because I think it puts too much onus on the the um, insurrectionists who um, were inciting rebellion and criming at the Capitol on Wednesday. And I think it's just a much larger question of white supremacy in the United States, which is a feature of, not a bug. I mean, they're, they're, Trump is an extension of Andrew Johnson and he's an extension of Woodrow Wilson and he's an extension of John Kennedy. He's an extension of white power and the executive branch in a million ways, right? In the same way that John Roberts is an extension of white supremacy, which the court has always upheld through property rights. And he, and this moment is, I don't, anybody who studies, I don't know, race is clear that this is white supremacy and so it's everywhere. It can't just be located in one day in one series of acts by a small-ish group that had some military trained personnel inside of it. It has to be seen as part of a larger public history of the way in which whiteness exists to maintain itself and perpetuate itself at the expense of people of color. So that's Muslim lands and that's you know building the wall um, you know, at the border, and that's the, the detainment policy with ch children of of immigrants, and it's you know it it is anti LGBTQ politics in the administration, and it's it is all of those things. So I think for me, there are academic distinctions to be made about the form of power that was being asserted, but I think the more important thing is for me, and what I've been talking about all week is about convergence, and that's when like huge ideas or huge you know. Um, forms of ideology converge together and meld. And that's really what's happening because it's police power and it's U.S. empire. It's fascism and neo-authoritarianism. It's neoliberalism. It's, it's tech, it's, it, you know, it's tech companies. It is finance capital. It is anti-blackness. So all of those things are producing, I think, a really um, fluid historical moment, but they're part and parcel of, you know, what the U.S. has always been and what it has, it has delighted in being um, for a long time. So, you know, I, the technical term for the political scientists is probably auto coup, but I, I really, I don't think that that's as important as an insurrection. I also think, I was saying this to a friend yesterday, you know, I've been colloquially referring to this as Nazi, Nazi, Nazi stuff all over the internet. And then today, New York Times wrote a big, um, you know, piece about the Nazification and the anti-Semitic symbols and the anti-Semitic T-shirts, and you know, on on the folks who stormed the Capitol. And I just and Arnold Schwarzenegger released a gorgeous video. If you haven't seen it, you should. Um, today, comparing Wednesday to to Kristallnacht and to the ransacking of Jews in Austria and Germany. And so I really just think that there is a way in which, especially for the boomer generation, we need, they need to understand this as like the return, like the return of open Nazis in the United States, which of course has also always been here. You'll recall that we passed four neutrality acts before uh, the, the invasion of uh, the bombing of Pearl Harbor so the US would not get involved in Adolf Hitler's ascension in Europe. So, you know, the Nazi part is hyper American, like they got it from us and we are in a public resurgence of that in a way that we haven't quite seen in, in since the 30s. So, you know, I, I think calling it a coup misses a lot of nuance and uh, the historical structures of anti-Blackness and anti-Jewishness and empire. And I also think convergence helps us understand this historical moment as a part and product of what the U.S. has always been. Um. That was a lot of words, Robin. Yeah, that was a lot of words. Lot well, of I'm words. just thinking like what hits me is, yeah, it's not a bug, it's a feature. It's it's not an outside group. This is actually no. the, the, this is the 400 years of just the lifeblood of American white supremacy. Yeah, this is the cotton oligarchy was a real estate mogul. I mean, so what does it mean if the call's coming from inside of the house, the whole house yeah. is full of this. Yeah. So how can it be a coup 
if all of the people are in on it. Like it, it conspiracy is, it is an infantilized articulation of power given how broad the support for Trump is. It is an infantilized notion of power. It is a dissociation with how closely, you know, all of the organs of power collaborate around white supremacy. So, you know, that's the bad news of it is that it's every, it's not, it's not like there are other places where the white supremacy is not organizing the power. I will say too, that the Trump administration has decimated the civil service in DC. I spent 10 years there. I've worked in politics for 25 years. It's completely decimated. So all of the people who are coming in into the Biden, Biden administration, they're training in hiring and replacing both folks who have who have jumped ship because they wanted to get out of the Trump administration or in, de in departments, cabinet departments that have been totally decimated by him. They are having to do basically trauma informed hiring about how to deal with, you know, the, the horrific despondency in government. And so like, I just really, for people who don't know how big the US government is in its bureaucracy, I don't think that they can really conceptualize how how devastating it is to say be working on clean water and clear clean air at the EPA, and then have all of that work for the last 50 years completely undermined by one Yahoo at the top and, and his collaborators. And so it's a real, it's, it's, it's endemic. It is so deep. And it is so big, the scope of it is huge. So I, coup does not get at that for me. Right, because this is, oh, mm -mm. yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to sort of wrap your head around the severity of the divide. And then also the, it seems, I mean, based on the numbers, like it's not like it's a small faction, right? It's not, I mean, 75 million people voted for Trump. So yeah it's a lot of a big old chunk it's you know it's a big chunk and i think that i think that for people who don't think about race right for white people who d don't understand racial politics they want to pretend like oh this was like six thousand people or what you know whoever how whatever the number is going to end up being about people who are at the capitol on wednesday that's like oh my gosh it's so much bigger than that but i will say that they're not all the same right so there are like really i think important class distinctions about who goes to washington i had a conversation with a colleague about the women's march in 2016 17 and she was like are you going to go to the women's march and i was like you got to be kidding me absolutely not and she's like why and i was like why are you spending your money on that like, why would you not send that money to a voting rights organization or an, you know, like an abortion fund or something like that's going to be a bunch of white ladies out on parade who are producing the same kind of white grievances that their husbands are when they, you know, go to the gun range pretending to be militiamen with the AR-15. So I just... I. You know, I just, I'm thinking a lot about the Women's March and all those white women in their pussy hats getting their pictures taken with cops in DC. Um, and just about the convergence of whiteness as the overdetermination for what possibilities exist in a country that that is becoming, you know, minority majority as, um, you know, people of color um, are given the rights that they're duly um, supposed to have. So yeah, it's, it's bad news out there is what I would say. But I think white people don't recognize the scope of it. So one thing um, that I read today was that one of the big funders of just getting folks on the buses to DC for this, whether it had to do with the insurrection or not, was like women for Trump. Yeah. Um, and so when you're talking about white women and their sort of performative. Lady Nazism, what I've been calling it, their lady Nazism, yes. Lady Nazism. You know, and it is, it's like, it's, it's it, to understand it as anything other than a race conversation is to, I think, misunderstand the, I think it's not, you know, it's not the economy stupid, right? No, I will say, you know, I, I think about it a lot here in Arkansas because the reason that desegregation died is because white ladies organized in at Central High and they refused to desegregate Central High in 1957. And it was white ladies who created the groups that killed desegregation so that their kids didn't have to go to school with black kids. And they created the segregation academies across the entire US South. So it's white ladies who are producing fascism and producing fascists and raising them and teaching their Sunday school catechism classes. It is the white ladies who are doing it. So, you know, it, it, there is a way in which coup also doesn't get at the gendered element of the white family and the way that it produces and reproduces white supremacy. That is not 
a useful term. I understand why the political theorists want to use it as a technical term of transitions of power and regime change, but it is so woefully inadequate in understanding the dynamics that produce this kind of, you know, domestic terrorism. It is white women who are who are doing this. And, you know, the people who are at the Capitol, I have taken, you know, A, I, I'm a wannabe humorist, right? And I think that contempt is a really important political tool and uh, in de disincentivizing people from participating in and coup things. So I think shitting on them publicly is really a good idea and contempt is a useful model. Um, but I also think, you know, those, a lot of those white people, the white women too, flew to DC in their private jets, right? Like they are benefiting from a massive rich poor gap that is disenfranchising poor white people. And they are benefiting from that stratification in a way that only augments their wealth and power. And so that's a problem too. Coup doesn't get at that dynamic. It doesn't get at the class dynamics of white supremacy. It doesn't get at the class dynamics of what the insurrection looks like. It's, this is not the same as, uh, you know, Osama bin Laden's Afghanistan when the US went in and steamrolled the shit out of, out of that country after the Soviets invaded in 81 and created a whole, a whole country full of, you know, of children who were orphans with no food supply. The radicalization of a place like Afghanistan, you know, does not is not the same as what's happening in the radicalization of the United States, even where poverty is part of the equation. So, you know, one thing that's missing completely is a class analysis of how white finance capital is backing domestic terrorists against the full, you know, participation of people of color in the economy and in the political structure. So, you know, who doesn't get at that? What do you think? Uh, give us your thoughts on Biden's comments and how you think um, this week will influence his inauguration. I think Biden's actually doing pretty well. I mean, you know, there's no way that he did not know that this was coming. So he is not one of the white people that was caught unaware. Um, and I think he's actually ha handling himself well. I mean, you know, the contrast between tantruming Twitter, now ex Twitter handle user Trump, and, you know, grown up even with his adult white man flaws is pretty huge gulp. And so what I think is happening both uh, in, in the Biden camp and in the Pelosi Schumer camp in Congress is they're making a play at realignment, which is also what happened during, you know, during the US Civil War. So it's not incidental that civil war becomes the metaphor for understanding the racial politics of the moment. And so the idea is to realign power so that the moderate Republicans, the ones who are, you know, using legal but not not I don't know, seditious means to gather power um, are stripped away either into the Democratic Party, which I, you know, is a problem, or into their own party, right, as a moderation to the armed militia, Reddit troll, 4chan, white supremacists. And so, you know, you're seeing Mitt Romney and Lisa Murkowski and Pat Toomey in, in Congress lead that way. And I think that that's the deal. So if I'm Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer, I am going to try and make a bid to strip away moderate Republicans out of the GOP to denounce it because you've got to, it's going to have to be stamped out uh, politically. But but you're still going to have to live next to seditionists and and, and well armed, you know, folks who want to coup. And so it's a long term problem about how to. Uh, de-radicalize, uh, you know, insurgent domestic terrorists. If you were Biden, what does your first 100 days look like? Uh, you pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, you pass the $2,000 stimulus check, you forgive $10,000 in student debt, uh, you sure, you, you're gonna, he's gonna have to shore up capital security and strip some of that military budget away to shore up democratic institutions in the US. Um, I, th I, think, I think his goal is to get the millennials on board to ride for the Democratic Party for the duration. I think if you're Pelosi Schumer, you push impeachment because you want to get an up down vote from every single member of Congress, and then you crush them in the 2022 midterm elections. You absolutely savage them. 
them. And so that's the role of impeachment. I think Biden understands that he has to stay far away from that because that's Congress's, you know, mess to wait in. I, you know, Clyburn was saying today that they might wait um, for the impeachment until after the inauguration, which I think is not a, a terrible idea. I think the hard thing about this is timing, right? The White House, Pence is saying Trump is unstable. That should surprise zero people. But also, I think it's probably an exaggeration about, you know, his concern for Trump's mental health in the, in the next few days. And on the other hand, the, the real desire from a broad swath of Americans that they want to see accountability for these terrorists and all who aided and abetted them. So that's a big job. You know, declaring it, you know, writing articles of impeachment is less labor than bringing to heel, you know, centuries of white supremacist empire building in D.C. So they've got their work cut out for them. But I think if I'm Biden, I go for the millennials and I give out the money that Congress refused to authorize because McConnell held the vote on the two thousand dollar stimulus checks. And I also expand uh, production and distribution of vaccines and try and get as many people as vaccinated as possible. So, you know, I think that the path for him in terms of executive power is actually pretty clear. And I think I think that there will be no ambiguity about it. Uh, so a question from our audience, how do you, uh, how do we make sure that Biden meets this moment, especially for the black voters who helped bring him to the White House? Mm, I think that's a good question about accountability. I will say that I, I'm not, I wouldn't call this optimistic, but I think there's absolutely no doubt that they owe the Senate to Stacey Abrams and to Black voters. So I would say this is the very first electoral cycle where media created a public narrative uh, of accountability where Black voters got the credit they deserved for producing Democratic victories. And the reason for that is because when Obama won in 08, the newsroom started hiring more black journalists to put on the air and in print. And so I think that that decision in major newsrooms across the country has helped to shift the way that the reporting has happened. I will say also that this is a BLM moment. And so in some ways, you know, when we talk about generational cohorts and the way in which securitization moments frame their cohort, like 9-11, you know, I'm, I am hopeful that BLM and Occupy have shaped the Gen Xers and um, you know the Gen Y and millennials in a way that helped them retain a sensibility about the kind of horrific labor involved in producing a new civil rights vocabulary that pushes the Democratic Party to left. Now, there are reasons to doubt that. And I, I obviously I write about, you know, prison power and imprisonment and, you know, white supremacy. And so it's not hard to see all the ways the Democrats can screw it up, can screw it up. However, I do think that the choice of Merrick Garland at the Department of Justice for AG and Vanita Gupta and Kristen Clark as his two emissaries there will help rebuild a Department of Justice that for the first time ever really has its charge as racial inequality and to protecting people of color and their rights and Nazi hunting. And I think that for me, I have actually quite a bit of um, optimism about the fact that Kamala takes that as her charge. You'll have to remember Merrick Garland, his, his mentor was Janet Reno. And, you know, he prosecuted the Oklahoma City bombing. So he has a sensibility about domestic terrorism about him that other AG nominees would not have. And I think he's a very, very sensible, good choice for AG. And I think that he's building out a team that will take seriously the role of the Department of Justice in, um, in I don't know, prioritizing uh, racial justice as a part of any pro-democracy movement going forward inside of the federal government. So how do black people keep him accountable? Praise him when he does things correctly. So when you see something that you support, whether it's in your state legislature or whether it's in your municipality or you see it in the federal government, amplify that, right? Reward the people who are doing that kind of work. I do think that there will be, especially if the Lewis Voting Rights Act is passed, there will be more money coming for groups like Stacey Abrams's. I think the other thing is that, you know, Biden is a, a lever of power, but so are the, the multi-gazillionaires. So I will be curious to see what happens to Mike Bloomberg, whose mouth has been very, very shut for the last couple of months to see where he is going to dump a bunch of his money because he seems like the kind of billionaire that you would want 
want to dump a bunch of money into voting rights in the South for grassroots organizing. For the white folks who are who are who are thinking about this, you know, those are the groups, you know, fair fight and unionization, you know, movements. Those are the kinds of things that you want to be paying attention to. I do think I just want to say again, though, that I do think that the media is actually doing a really good job of framing uh, the political cover for Biden to end Kamala Harris to push left on pol over policing and incarceration. I think they are taking it seriously in a way that Democratic can candidates have not. And I think you're gonna see it ripple through Congress, especially depending on what happens to the traitors that are, have already been elected to the US Congress. If they are, um, if they are removed from office, uh, I think that there will be a reckoning coming and, and, and people of color need to support that, in my opinion. Um, what role do Kamala Harris and Merrick Garland play in I, reshaping that executive branch? They're gonna hire, right? So they're gonna find all of the people who have the commitment to racial justice, even if it's not as left as BLM leaders, and they are going to they are going to repopulate the civil service and reformulate the um, institutional norms of, in, especially the Department of Justice, but I think probably also the FBI, which is without a doubt the most conservative institution in, D in DC on the domestic side. I think that they will populate those with folks who actually do want to do the work of changing the norms. And I think that the insurrection, I mean, as it was happening, I, I kind of wrote on, on Facebook, I said, you know, this is really going to consolidate a bunch of new support behind Biden to actually move to the left on racial justice issues. So I think that even though it's a horrible thing and we don't ever wanna see anything else like it, I do think that it creates political pressure on moderate Republicans uh, and on moderate Democrats to move to the left on racial justice issues in a way that has never happened before. Like, you know, the only time that I think that the DOJ has even had any real clarity about hunting white supremacists who were um, producing domestic terrorism was Mississippi Freedom Summer in 1964 after the lynching of Goodman, Schwerner, and Cheney. And, uh, and the civil, you know, and then they were forced to basically dredge the swamps uh, in Mississippi to find those bodies. And they found hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of other, you know, lynched um, black Americans. So there has never been a racial justice charge um, you know, even with Eric Holder as AG, or maybe especially with Eric Holder as AG, you would have thought that there would be more um, movement there. I do think that though there are a bunch of burrowers that are Trumpers that are burrowing into those institutions across, across you know, all of the agencies in the US government that are gonna be a long-term problem because they have lifetime appointments. So, you know, the I, the thing to do is to hire and fill out those those agencies and try and shore up a democracy as, as much as you possibly can. So I think Kamala will actually pay, play a huge role there, especially given Bi Biden's advanced age. Audience question: What should Biden give away to appease a progressive progressives whilst protecting the status quo? Mm, what should he give away? I mean, you know, it's interesting in some way. It, Stacey Abrams did the groundwork in um, in Georgia. There's absolutely no doubt about that. But the conversation around a $15 minimum wage uh, that that Bernie championed for a long time has done a lot of work. And I just really don't understand why Dem Dem Democrats don't want to run on that because they were running against Trump and he was such an easy target to run against. And that sort of worked for them. But I think that if I am Biden, I go really hardcore wage and jobs. I, I do think that Manchin today was talking about the importance of an infrastructure bill. And I think that that could be, I, they're gonna use securitization as the language, which is unfortunate, but understandable. Uh, I don't know that it'll be forgivable. It depends on what the language looks like, but I think that there will be a massive infrastructure bill, especially given all of the infrastructure meme jokes, like, oh, is it infrastructure week, week again? I think that there is an attention to the Trump administration's complete and total lack of attention to infrastructure. And, you know, I've been thinking a bunch today about, you know, the Russian hacking scandal and Russian infiltration of the 2016 election and the destruction of the NRA and the way that I think we're going to find out that the Russians have been funneling a bunch of money to the Proud Boys, as well as to dark money groups. And so I, I do think that, um, that, that 
the progressives would do well to continue pushing for a higher minimum wage and a federal job guarantee. I think they could get the minimum wage. I doubt that they'll get the federal job guarantee right now. But if there is enough convergence around a more lefty agenda, and I think that that is possible, and the Biden-Harris administration or a Harris administration and let's cross our fingers for Sherrod Brown, they could produce a longer standing series of concessions to the left that would really move the country forward. Given the role of white rioters and looters at the Capitol um, this week, how do you think the Biden administration manages the alt-right and neo-Nazis? I mean, I think if, if I were advising Biden right now, I would say, keep doing what you're doing, force the FBI to have a bunch of public tape arresting all, all of the Nazis that you can. So that is good for deterring more insurrection action. Um, and I think, but it's a long-term strategy. So I see Meredith is asked here in the chat, I think a, a looming question about de-radicalization. I think it looks different in different communities because the radicalization comes from different places. So I was talking, I don't know if it was you Meredith that I was talking to with, with today, but um, a bunch of folks have asked me about this and I'm like, the radicalization comes from a different, a bunch of places. So it's, you know, veterans who are on disability and can't leave their homes. And so they're on the internet all day. It is being in silos where you don't have access to a wide swath of news because you don't have real broadband. It is being in religious cults and in churches that embrace um, domestic terrorism because white supremacy is the religion and not the teachings of say Christ. You know, it comes from a whole host of things. So I don't think that de-radicalization looks the same in all the same places for all the same people. I think that there's a bunch of really instructive literature about, you know, how to, how to, how to um, think through cults, for example, right? So there are elements of cultism that are part of the Trumpism base that is, has to be part of the conversation. So, you know, I think depending on the community, you have to think about the sources of the radicalization. Is it poor public schools? Because the public schools are funded through property uh, taxes and that's based on how wealthy the community is. If so, I mean, one large, one large source of radicalization is underfunded public schools. So what do we do there, right? Like, so we have to fix that for sure if it's merely a question of lack of access to information or critical thinking training or extracurricular activities that, you know, like debate or something that teach people how to understand a wide variety of sources and ideas that are contradictory. Um, you know, I think part of it is uh, the media itself. So I suspect that the lawsuits against um, OAN and Newsmax are going to be successful and that those news organizations will shudder. So, you know, what do we do about that? Well, we have to think about independent media and how we support them. I know, Sarah, I've got a whole bunch in here for, about libraries. So I, I completely support you. Librarians, but also nurses in every school, right? So we don't have health care in, in, in rural schools and they don't have access to health care at all. So I think we want to think through the role of schools in producing a healthy um, public culture. Social workers, maybe. Historically, social workers have been almost exclusively white and have been used to really go into black and brown homes and disrupt black and brown families through total surveillance. So I think social work actually needs to be reimagined as a not white savior thing in order for it to be good. But if you saw the news out of California today, you'll see that they're using some of their funds to not replace police officers, but to replace them with trauma informed social workers. I think that that's a step in a different direction. It's definitely better than cops who are armed. But I think that there are you know other issues about social workers that present different problems that are part and parcel of you know white supremacy as it became part of the progressive era in the 1940s. I think, you know, I think for me though, the de-radicalization is the thing and that comes through communities, that's families and churches and schools and local, local, local. So, you know, I think, I think it's been interesting going through the quarantine um, and thinking through who gets cut out of social, of your social group because of the quarantine. The one thing is, is that the, you know, the white supremacists have been gathering and so they are, are not physically isolated from other people. It's gonna be very interesting to see what happens when the liberals who have been quarantining however 
well um, uh, come back out into society with each other. I think they're going to be weird and awkward, and I don't know how well that they will want to mingle and mix and organize. So I think one thing that you know liberals have to think through is like, you know, what are you willing to do to save your democracy, and what happens when it's at odds with public health policy? Because I will tell you that the white supremacists have already asked and answered that question, and you know what side they're on. So they were willing to take these huge, huge, huge risks that were obviously that are problematic um, because they wanted to secure what they thought was freedom. And I think, you know, the vaccine will help with that. But we just, you know, I think, you know, folks who are pro-democracy just lost a whole year of, of, of organizing slash organizers. The good side is that there are a bunch of people now who understand the stakes are higher. And so hopefully they'll put, but they'll participate. But, um, you know, everybody else has been doom scrolling instead of voter reg. So. Anyway, I'm, I'm going to agree with uh, Susanna, though, there that they they didn't see it as a risk because they think it's fake. So it's not like they were willing to say to, like, put it on the line. They're like, COVID's not real. So I'm going to go do the thing. Yeah, I don't disagree. But Just like, conceptually. If, you, if but if you are going to go and, you know, and I don't know, say, uh, register people to vote for the first time when there's voter intimidation at the polls, there are actual risks for liberals and leftists that actually don't exist. So I don't disagree with that. I'm just saying that they were willing to do the damn thing. And yeah. so this is the moment where people need to be willing to do the damn thing because the, the, the consequence is fascism, period. There's no middle ground. There's no, it's not a yeah. slippery slope. We're sliding down the slope. So we're already sliding. So you, people have to be willing to, you know, take risks and, I, that is not where the liberals have been. They are not. And also, I don't. I, I the thing about consequence is real. So the entire conversation that's happening in Congress right now about accountability is a real one. What account? What can, What accountability can you provide for the state when it controls itself? Is a major question. And if you can't control it, and if you can't provide accountability, what are you prepared to do? Because I, I'm just saying that's the conversation that's happening on the other side, even though you know, they also are engaging in fantasies of power that are, you know, in some ways congruent with, in some some ways incongruent with, you know, the rea reality that some of us are living in. So you've talked a lot about how this moment was completely predictable because white supremacy is structural. Can you talk with us about, about this week's event in hindsight? Um, yeah, in hindsight, I think that there is such a lack of literacy about governance and about how things work that perhaps people have a better sensibility now about what they don't know. I talk a lot when I'm doing, you know, lectures to groups about know what you don't know. And I think that this was a moment where people were forced to reckon with some of the things that they don't know. I think that the media actually did really well for the most part in covering the insurrection, both in their um, in their racial politics about it and also in their in their risks in getting footage and commentary and even when it's incriminating like I just the amount of tape that I saw where the journalist is just like, what's your name and where are you from? And just got all of the personal details is fascinating. I think um, big tech coming out to de-platform um, Trump is huge. I think the PGA censuring Trump or whatever word we're going to use to talk about them kicking him out of their hallowed halls is fascinating. I think the Forbes letter about not hiring anybody from the Trump press shop is fascinating. So there are ways in which neoliberalism is converging to create accountability where government can't do it itself. And I think if I am in the Biden administration, I want to think really hard about what does it mean to be forced to live with the consensus from the Fortune 500 companies when your own government can't secure freedom. So, you know, do you want the tyranny, you know, in Washington or do you want the tyranny of Amazon? The, the answer is always unions, but I mean, I think, the, I think thinking about finance capital and the way that it is used to discipline authoritarianism is a really important space where liberals need to be thinking critically about yeah. Yeah, their alliances. 
So that was something you and I were talking about prior to opening the chat. Yeah. Uh, uh, sort of the that weird moment we're in where, you know, you wake up and you say, uh, this is something I put on my Facebook, like, am I in a parallel universe where capitalism saves the day in our institutions? Yeah, as our institutions sort of say, like, I guess fascism is what we're doing now. And so I would like to just like take a minute to unpack a little bit about, so the thing that I'm thinking about the most, and I, cause I feel like it's gotta be a place where pressure can be applied is this summer when every single brand that you've ever heard of, that you've literally ever, like every shoe you've ever bought, every plant stand that's ever been ordered, like they all came out with their, um, their equity statements, right? And, and June was the month of, you know, MailChimp equity statements. And I think that every organization that released an equity statement in June needs to be followed back up with today <laughs> and say, okay, now what? So where do you, where are you now? Um, because, you know, deplatforming is wonderful. Like this social media deplatforming is thrilling. What else? What else can be done? You know, like, can money be pulled? What can be done? Well, two things. One, the deplatforming is too little too late. And also just the amount of liberals who were rubbernecking and bemoaning the absence of Trump on Twitter shows the depth of the depravity about how much white liberals participated in the circus show Carnival Barker authoritarian presidency. So that's one thing. And I do think following the money is the thing. I mean, all, this investigation into the dark money going into the, the Republican AGs, I mm -hmm. think is going to be a, potentially a game changer. I, Susanna says, yes, the social media companies are trying to avoid re regulation. They are. And that's one place where the Biden administration is going to obviously have influence, whether it's over the FCC or the reg or it's also interesting, like, does the GOP, are they sad that they killed net neutrality now, right? All, there is a way in which the social media convergence of the moment is really reshuffling the deck. Um, the other thing I guess I was thinking about I, last night, I suppose, is um, is about regulation in general, right? So a bunch of the GOP SADs are about wanting more regulation, right? Because obviously it's self-serving. They feel, you know, whatever they say about whatever, whether it's the debt ceiling or deficit spending or regulation is all self-serving. But I do think that a bunch of the traditional assessments of the sort of memes of government have the potential to change here. Uh, yeah, I think following the money is going to be useful. Like I said, I think the Russians are probably funding the Proud Boys now that the NRA has kind of been run into the ground. And it will be interesting to see what kinds of, I don't know, information comes out of a differently invigorated foreign policy apparatus. Um, but I, I, it's curious too, I saw today that they were spray painting in St. Louis uh, for Holly to resign on the streets. And you know the men who who backed him, his mentor, but also the men who bundled his money in the Senate race are like, this is the worst decision I've ever made. So I do think that there is a line in the sand here that everybody's trying to figure out, you know, what it is and how they're going to address it. But there is an opportunity, I think, to pull funding. I just it shouldn't have to be that way. You shouldn't have, to, you know, capitalism should not be the like fourth estate or like the backstop against the Nazis. That's shitty politics. So, but I, but I will say again, the thing that the, the Trumpists are doing is that they are defining the terms of freedom for them and their communities. And the liberals don't talk about freedom ever. They don't care about their own freedom. They don't care about the freedom of other people. And I think that's a place where there's not convergence, where the right has controlled the narrative for so long, since the 80s, for sure, that, you know, even BLM's, you know, introduction of new vernaculars has still not trickled into white life in a way that could help shore up places where the convergencies can help root out fascism as a feature of American public life. So, you know, I think that that we do not want capitalism to be the backstop against the Nazis. That is bad politics. So even if it's a stopgap to help kneecap fascism right now, it is not a long-term strategy, period. Audience question. Yep. Is it correct to say that Trump's Twitter ban was the hardest hit to Trumpism in the last four years? And what does it mean when private platforms are the most dynamic in the nation? 
No, it is not. But that's already there. Everybody else is still on talking about where they're going to go and what they're going to do and what they're going to bring. And, you know, they're making up their, their um, conspiracy theories. So I think, you know, I think it was a way of avoiding liability for if Trump used it to support some other massive insurrectionist thing that is obviously already being planned. So no, I, I do not in any way think that it was the biggest thing. I also, you know, all of the other people are on all of the chat chat places doing the same thing that they've done. If this is not a small corner of the internet where this kind of planning and chatter happens, even though the number at the Capitol was small and visually kind of gauche and diverse, this is a huge swath these are your family members and your neighbors and your teachers and your preachers and they are everywhere so it's not like this is some small group that just has to be exposed and then we get back to normal so one of the things i hate about the biden administration even though i understand why they're using the language is the entire idea of normalcy is such a normalization of white supremacy that i really i really hate the operation operationalization of normal as a thing to valorize or, or have nostalgia for or return to, I think that is not useful. So yeah, I, I don't think it was a big blow whatsoever. I think it, it detracted, I mean, I think it, it humiliates Trump, which in some ways makes him more dangerous. Um, but Susanna is absolutely right. It's a question of liability and regulation. It is not a question of a long-term effect on white supremacist organizing in the country. What happens to the alt-right short-term and long-term? In the short-term, you know, I think it's hard to say the effect that the public arrests will have. I think people will be deterred uh, from being dragged out of their homes uh, on tape and, and, you know, convicted or tried and convicted. Uh, and I think that there's some deterrence value to that because one of the things that is happening with the alt-right is that they're as interested in social capital as they are in finance capital. And so the tech thing is interesting because it complicates the social capital, the landscape of social capital potentially. So if you can shame them on media where they're supposed to be heroes, there might, there might be some value to that. Not as a long-term political strategy, but as a short-term strategy in deterring any more you know, insurrectionist violence. Uh, in the long term, I think without a comprehensive understanding of white supremacy, they just grow and grow and grow. So, you know, like, let's say that a bunch of these folks go to prison. What do you think happens to their families? You're just creating more fascists there, right? Their absence or their presence create more more problems in some ways. So we still have to deal with the question of de-radicalization and how to manage, you know, domestic terrorism in a country that is so divided and divisive. And that means you have to take care of people so that they are not hungry and you have to give them access to freedom. Yeah, Twitter's going to make more money. Twitter is never going to do poorly. No matter what they do, they're never going to do poorly. Yeah, that's right. The Arkansas General Assembly starts tomorrow. Yes, I know. It's going to be hard. What can we expect in this I, session? I mean, I think people need to um, really understand that their legislators are entering extremely hostile physical environment and the governor is very weak and is under attack by his own caucus and has been for the duration of the last year in greater or lesser degrees. And it is going to be the most probably vitriolic legislative session in modern memory, maybe ever, very possibly ever. Uh, and so they should expect the worst of the worst on every issue that they could possibly care about. Um, and they have a governor who uh, doesn't have a back door. I mean, there's gonna be a lot of interest in the hate crime bill that's happening. Um, I think that it, it has garnered a lot of support across the aisle 
And this is a hyperpolarizing moment where the alt-right wing of the General Assembly wants to strip out LGBTQ protections because they want a license to hunt queer people. And I and also Ballinger is running stand your ground. And so the you know militarization of the state of Arkansas is in some ways the early referendum issue in the state. And I, I, it had stand your ground in particular has been defeated historically. So there is bipartisan um, opposition to stand your ground. But in the wake of the Capitol insurrection, I think that that might cut a different way. And the governor is not going to necessarily have as much sway uh, as he has had in previous legislative sessions to hold that bill or influence that bill. And the legislature has also gone further to the right. So uh, ideologically, I mean, but also, uh, you know, the, the, the GOP has a um, supermajority. So I think it's gonna be a very tough session. I will say, I've been thinking a lot today about the importance of housing and um, uh, renter's bill of rights and bills of habitability and landlord tenant laws. And I think for me in this political moment, that's a place where I don't imagine a bunch of liberals have thoughts, but I, I've written a bunch about it on Facebook today. And I think, I think that's one place where people need to be thinking more about how are we taking care of people in Arkansas? Where are they living? I mean, we just saw massive evictions as a result of a poorly managed COVID response in Arkansas, where, you know, because there are no landlord tenant laws, landlords could just evict ten tenants at will, uh, especially if there was not a uh, rent relief. And so I think that for me, that's one place where I'm most um, interested and um, I'm really supportive of that legislation. I think liberals need to read more and follow more and support more of that. And obviously they need to follow the gun debate and the hate, the hate crime legislation because all of the vitriolic alt-right white supremacy stuff that they just saw happen on Wednesday is all gonna come out in the general assembly, especially around, those, around guns and about punishment. So uh, I also think we're gonna see a bunch of really progressive legislation about solitary confinement and about inc and incarceration that I hope people will follow and pay attention to. Um, and I, I think we're gonna obviously see abortion bills that try and ban abortion in Arkansas that I ultimately think will fail, but that will catalyze a bunch of that right-wing attention that's so anti-female. So uh, an audience member asks, should we be calling our representatives and senators now? If so, what are the risks? Are any members of our delegations even amenable to pressure right now? Um, for the congressional delegation, yet you should always create political pressure, okay? So whether they're on record as being for or against blah, 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 they are still elect, you, you're their constituents. So you have to create pressure on them all the time, regardless of what their publicly stated position is, full stop. So yes, call them. Yes, call them. Yes, call them. I think, you know, I think some of them are more vulnerable than others. The entire congressional delegation obviously uh, supported Trump and none of them have come out and condemned him personally. So I don't imagine that will change, but they have to face the music. So, you know, it's just like being the dog catcher. You still have to go to the grocery store and see people who disagree with your decisions. So you have to continue to keep up pressure. The more public it is, the better. The more consequences you can rack up um, as leverage against those people, the better. And also people need to run for office. So, you know, one of the things that, you know, the alt-right has done is depressed um, the bench uh, in the Democratic Party in particular. Um, and I think more people need to run for office and I think they need to help in campaigns. They need to participate in campaigns. It's not enough just to cast your vote. It's not enough to give a one-time donation. That is not sufficient to defeat fascism. It is not sufficient. It's necessary, but not sufficient. So I think everybody needs to have a come to Jesus moment where they think realistically about how much they have been participating in creating a plural democracy and how much more they can do. Because it, whatever you have been doing, it is not enough right now. But yes, call. Um. How about in terms of the 2022 electoral cycle in Arkansas statewide offices in the congressional delegation? 
I mean, I think that you are going to see Bozeman is out. Uh, he's going to write. <laughs> Uh, retire. And so that seat's going to be open and it's going to be an interesting race. The governor's race is going to be open. Um, right now, it, it looks like it's going to be AG, Leslie Rutledge, um, Tim Griffin, Lieutenant Governor, and Sarah Huckabee Sanders, although who knows what the fallout's going to be on her as aiding and abetting an insurrectionist uh, alt-right presidency. I think um, for me, it's going to be very interesting to see if an independent party candidate actually does emerge, either for that Senate race or for the governor's race. And I think you're going to see the alt-right lineup. I mean, I don't, I don't think it. You, you are going to see the alt-right members of the General Assembly line up for all the constitutional offices uh, in the states. And I think you're going to see that repeat its, its way all the way through the South and all the way through the middle of America. You know, Iowa, Nebraska, Kansas. Oklahoma, I think you're going to see a real snapback further to the right in the states than you will see at the federal level, both in response to the popularity of Trumpism and as a counter movement against a more liberal plural democracy and a reorganization of power in DC. So, you know, I think, you know, one of the things that we need to think about in terms of what's successful, as I was talking about Stacey Abrams, is that that was an organic movement of a bunch of organizations who were based in Georgia and funded by Georgians for the most part that was doing the hard work of going door to door and building community and doing voter reg and doing voter education and 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 thinking through uh, what a different kind of demo democratic participation participatory structure in Georgia might look like. That happened because they did the work there. What happens in Arkansas because it's small and cheap is that billionaires to come in and they try and buy right votes and because it's so small but that works poorly uh here it's it you know in, in many ways so i think we need more sustained grassroots organizing and bonnie i think bonnie miller's on the call we talk a lot about ballot initiatives and direct democracy and arkansas is one state where direct democracy is possible and that's a place where i think people need to think about um what it means to help build out uh, and organiza organizations and also, uh, I don't know, information channels that move outside of, you know, Fox News, cable news, right? Because one thing that's happening is that people are fed this steady diet of shouty bullshit white people, and they're turned off from participating in politics, where politics is really about the intimacy of mutual aid and of problem solving in local communities. And people are more excited about that always. So in Arkansas, for example, the ballot initiatives are usually approved with way wide margins across you know, party lines because people want to do democracy themselves. And they're skeptical of people who are you know, anointed to produce governance on their behalf. And I think that skepticism of governance here in Arkansas and in states like Arkansas can actually be used to help build out more political participation, both issue-based and general in ways that we haven't seen before, even with, even with the finance capital that we have in the state. Yes, thanks, Bonnie. Yes, it's a, the ballot initiative is an important tool. We need to save it. We need to double down and we need to use it. I, I think that it's incalculably important here, especially given the way that the state's um, representation in the General Assembly has been gerrymandered for so long. Redistricting will be a huge conversation. So moving forward, what does accountability look like for our elected officials, but also for our circles of influence? Mm, I think that's the most important because everybody's asking me, what do I do about, I mean, I had a, a conversation today that's like my parents are Trumpers and they've gotten more and more delusional. What do I do? And it's a big question, right? How do you deprogram your family from being, you know, authoritarian fascists? But I think, you know, my whole Facebook feed is like, I'm defriending my uncle and I understand why you want to do that for self-care. But as a political project, you know, I wouldn't say like, go and try and flip your abusers. But I do think that it's, it does not help people to live in silos where they don't interact with people who disagree with them. And the, you know, there, there's a reason why there aren't white Stacey Abramses, right? Stacey Abrams is doing the work of reenfranchising people who are owed 
democratic participation. White people do not want to do the work because it's hard to talk to the fascists among them because they're in their own families, but they're benefiting from their financial support and their stock portfolios and their trust funds and their inheritances. And, you know, they're benefiting from white supremacy when they don't go and confront, you know, the white supremacists in their own families. So some of them are not flippable, but the project for white people is to do the work of dismantling white supremacy. So I think accountability Accountability looks like confrontation. And, you know, confrontation is not always conflict. But I think that white people are so conflict averse, you know, th they don't want to have even low level conflict with their family members. Meredith is on this call and she says, yeah, every time you shut the door on folks in your family, there's a supremacist ready to fill the gap. One of the things that people are doing, even the wealthy ones with their jet planes, is they're trying to manufacture a sense of belonging. And belonging is a right and it is access to freedom. So if you want to fill the gap and deter white supremacy, you have to create networks of kinship and belonging that feed people. And this isn't a plea to like have empathy for the white supremacists so much as it is a practical assessment of the fact that you can't lock them all up in prison or wish them away. They are in your communities. You wave at them in your neighborhood, driving home after work. You see them at the grocery store. They, they cash your paycheck. They're in your offices. They're in your church pew. You know, they are in every aspect of your life. So it's not like there's like some other place where the other people are. That is how people get delusional about the state of race, for example, in America. So, you know, you have to have a different sense of belonging um, to offer these folks to bring them back in to be productive members of a democracy. I, you know, obviously at the beginning of the call, I was talking a lot about how COVID makes people weird, but also the alienation of COVID is driving people to make very different decisions about their intimate connections. And that's going to be something that we, we have to, you know, reckon with. It, it, everybody is going to have to make serious decisions about what they are willing to produce as emotional, social, financial labor in order to turn the, turn the tide against fascism. Yannick says decolonization of education. Girl, you know I'm on that page with you all day, every day. And I think critical race theory, I mean, one of the reasons why the Trump administration came back for critical race theorists is because they have the information about how to build new structures and infrastructures of belonging that are satisfying and give people access to tools of freedom. And you might not like what the insurrectionists were doing in terms of their language and vocabulary and means of freedom. But at the end of the day, they were trying to seize a kind of freedom that they felt that the government wasn't giving them. And, you know, especially because they were aided and abetted by so much of the U.S. government, you have to wonder for yourself if they were willing to seize your their own freedom even given the fact that they didn't think it was a huge risk what are will you willing to do to secure yours and your and your neighbors and the most vulnerable people because i'll tell you a democracy is only as strong as its weakest member and right now we have a massive rich poor gap that's been exacerbated by the trump administration certainly obama and previous administrations too after the the bush collapse in 08 but that rich poor gap means that there are a whole lot more people in some ways we're seeing a re refutalization of the United States, where the poor, the class of poor is growing so huge and the you know distribution of wealth among the quote unquote middle class has been shrunk so much that you are going to have the kind of class warfare that you have never seen in this lifetime. And it will be white liberal people, good white liberals who stood aside and did not wanna risk anything for freedom that let it happen. So it's a, this is in terms of accountability, it's not just how do we bring accountability to the insurrectionists, it's about self accountability for what have I not been doing? This, I mean, like we are so past the point where, you know, we can have like long conversations about whether or not we choose this strategy or that strategy. Right now it's, I mean, it's like all hands on deck. So even though I think the Biden administration is a foregone conclusion, the next 11 days are gonna create the grounds for new norms in terms of presidential inaugurations, first 100 days in office, transitions of power, rebuilding a completely defunct federal government, what state, state governments are gonna to do to manage the constant threat of Trumpism, even though Trump may be removed from office or abdicate on his own. I mean. I just really cannot overstate how everybody needs to look inside of their own house to say, what have I done well and what have I not done enough of and get themselves to have more skin in the game. And white people, I'm talking to you. This is not a thing for the people of color to save you from. 
So I'm gonna, we are not gonna get through all the questions. So like surprise, surprise, <laughs> um, as we usually don't. Um, there is one audience question that I really want us to get to and I, and I hope that they are still on the call. Um, comparatively speaking, the Black Lives Matter protests of 2020 were met with much more resistance than the Capitol riot. If and when police brutality becomes an issue again, how do minorities move forward knowing that group efforts are best served white? Um, yeah, well, I do think that the good news is that for white liberals, they're seeing the convergence of police power and fascism visually in a way that they could not, they, they can't avoid. Okay, so it's a confrontation with the truth uh, that I think is hard to run from. So the plausible deniability about the difference in treatment for, you know, I was just thinking of like, even the Kavanaugh hearings and the protests, which were a lot of white ladies treated so differently and with so much more violence with such a smaller group of nonviolent protesters than what happened here. So I do think that, that thinking about policing and security will be a nonstop conversation. I think that for me though, the, that is going to hinge on a lot of vision that I don't, I don't know where it will come from. I don't know if it will come from the state houses. I don't know if it will come from the feds. There's gotta be more vision work done about decoupling policing and man, and what is fundamentally the, the uh, over surveillance and, um, and car incarceration of black and brown people. So I do think that decarceration is one place where um, the, the movement has done well and that has a lot of bipartisan and popular support in Arkansas is actually decreasing uh, incarceration and shrinking the prison industrial complex and killing private prison contracts and you know ending cruel and, and unusual punishments and whatnot. So I think imprisonment is one place to go where there are going to be easier wins as we manage ambivalence about the police themselves. So I think that that's one major place. I do think, though, there, we're seeing some of the municipalities that cut off lethal force and that did not continue to augment their police forces, where they haven't had a single police fire a bullet. Newark, for example, this year has not had a single police officer discharge their weapon on or off duty and in 2020. So that is non-negligible data that supports uh, you know, ending lethal force in the police. And I think that that's one place where there will be interest convergence that also has da empirical data to help support a movement to end lethal force. I will say that I don't think ending lethal, lethal force ends white supremacy in the police forces because of a whole host of things about pensions and money. But I do think in one place that we think about securitization, we need to think about like, say the role of veterans, vet, you know, armed services veterans who participated in the insurrection. And, you know, there are ways to cut their VA benefits and strip their pensions and kick them off of TRICARE and really impact them. The problem is, is then they don't have the social services they need to be recalibrated. So, you know, universal health care, right? Medicare for all is a place where I think that would do a lot of good in both decreasing the quote unquote need for policing, but also increasing social services. So on the whole, on that side of the conversation, decarceration is going to have the most interest convergence and I think the easiest wins. And the answer to almost everything else is increased funding for social services, increased minimum wage, federal job guarantee, shore up social security, Medicare, Medicaid, expand SNAP benefits, you know, and ICE. I think ICE is probably one place if I had to pick like one security apparatus that has a bunch of negative attention attached to it. I think ICE detention abs absolutely has to end. Um, and that's a place where there is going to be more support in this administration, certainly than the last. In our last minute, <laughs> um, what do we do now? Like right now? I think you, so white liberals, they've been staying at home and they've been baking and uh, they've been puzzling and they have been um, stress eating 
and doom scrolling. And so they need to think about where they're gonna volunteer. Are they gonna vote, volunteer for voter registration? They need to do that as soon as possible because the midterm elections are here. They need to donate to organizations that safeguard public institutions. So Sarah Thompson, I, I wanted to talk about libraries, right? You need to donate money to libraries, rural libraries in particular, and you need to uh, donate to mutual aid organizations in your communities. You need to support disinformation campaigns, right? Especially through independent media. You need to work in your churches, right? So if you're going to a white church and they're not talking about this as an insurrectionist, fascist, authoritarian moment, you need to create pressure to have those kinds of conversations. Uh, you need to support critical thinking skills wherever they're taught, whether that's public debate programs. You need to support any kind of push for a new tax structure that's more equitable and fair. So anything that redistributes money from the billionaires back to the people who need money to eat and to pay their rent, you need to do that. You need to support the John Lewis Voting Rights Act and all infrastructure bills, especially as they include equity equity and inclusion um, perspectives. And you need to reflect on and support uh, movements like BLM and Occupy. So as I always plug Bonnie Miller's League of Women Voters, they're doing voter registration and ballot initiative work. Um, the League of Women Voters here in, in uh, Northwest Arkansas is really active and, and that's a good low entry. You don't need a ton of information to participate. You just got to show up and you will get the training that you need to participate in democracy more fully. I think we need to support you unionizations, especially unionization movement in a place like Amazon. Um, I think that those, uh, and Google for sure, I think unionization movements are going to have challenges, but also opportunities coming up. But I think on the whole, the point is to strengthen the institutions. So if that's if that's giving, um, you know, money to your local university, do that. If it's, you know, putting up more mutual aid, for, as a stopgap, you got to do that. But I think everybody needs to think about all of the ways in which they can divest from hobbies and reinvest in the democracy as a way of understanding really the magnitude of this political moment, which I cannot overstate. You can be doing more and you need to. I mean, I think even this call is a really good example of the desire to, to, to get in and figure out what what we can be doing, what we can be putting our hands on. This is a 90 minute call that kept 60 people on it, which is unheard of, especially because they weren't actually getting to talk. So, you know, I think that, um, I think we'll keep doing these, right? Um, we didn't get to all the questions. There's gonna be more questions. More things are gonna happen this week that are gonna beg more questions. Um, and so, you know, Thank you, Lisa, for everything always. Um, there's a good question, this last one. Um, Christina, what do you think, do you know about Braver Angels and what do you think about that platform? It's the sort of intersecting. Yeah, so Christina and I've actually talked about this. I think bridge building organizations are good. I think white people need conflict skills. So that is a skill everybody on this call can have about, uh, that's a skill you need is to be able to do productive conflict. Uh, you know, I think if I write about the civil rights black power movements and they had trainings constantly about how to deal with abuse and even just verbal conflicts with other people, that is a series of skills. It's a skill set. It's not something you're born with. It's something that you learn. So I think any of the groups that are doing um, conversational work about talking across differences are worth participating in for sure. And I also think that, you know, everybody here needs to learn grace and forgiveness, both about their own shortcomings, but also about the shortcomings of people who are good faith actors who, who don't have access to the same, um, you know, social welfare that you've had to benefit from. So I think, you know, we have to do better and we have to be more inclusive and we have to have the hard conversations and we have to get better at conflict and managing our own self-loathing and fear of um, intimacy with other people, especially if they're not like us. Well, Lisa, as always, thank you. Um, I have to say, I, I really do appreciate this collaboration that we've built. Um, I had, anecdotally, I have to say it, you know, I was writing the statement that my organization was going to release about the insurrection on social media when I got an inbox from Lisa saying, so we're going to do the thing right. 
Um, and I was like, yep, we're going to do the thing because that's what we do. So um, I imagine that, you know, what I would like actually to ask the people in the call, uh, if you have additional questions or there are other angles that you would like to expand on, um, you know, I actually can't come up with all the ideas and Lisa has all the answers, but not, not necessarily all the questions. So please send us the, the specific topics, specific conversations, specific questions you have, because we can do these all day. Like I'll, I'll keep inviting her back and she, at some point she'll say no, but like probably not for a minute. So um, thank you all for coming. It gives me hope that this many people are willing to give up 90 minutes of a Sunday night to have these conversations. So um, hopefully we'll see you soon. And you can email questions directly to me. It's robin at arkansasfashion.org or the internet that you found us on also works. So Lisa, as always, thank you so much. Thanks Robin, Good I appreciate it. Good to see you all. Take care of yourselves and let's go do some hard work. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.